Hey everyone, welcome to Curators of Culture, a podcast where I talk with creatives of various practices to discuss their backgrounds, how they navigate the world, what inspires them, and how they approach their work. I'm your host, Morgan Lee. I'm so honored to speak with our guest. He's a famed fashion journalist based in London, England, who champions diverse views in the industry. His unique approach to journalism has led him to being named the fashion critic for a new generation by Vogue magazine. He spends much of his time independently documenting various realms of the fashion world and writing for numerous publications. So without further ado, let's get into it. Here's my conversation with Fashion Roadman. Good afternoon for you, hopefully. Yeah. Very good afternoon. Good weather. Everything's yeah. going well. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's exciting. I'm going to be out there next month, so I'm hoping it's going to be good weather too. Uh, yeah, but I always start an episode by asking how we met. How did we meet? Uh, we met on Instagram. Didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I slid into the DMs. Um, I was trying, I should go back and like realize, like, what did I actually ask you for? I think it was just the podcast initially. Yep, it was. <laughs> For some reason, I started our chat with the zippers are zippering, lol. I don't know yeah. what that was about. <laughs> oh, maybe it was the um, the Louis Vuitton women's, maybe? I don't know if you posted anything about that, but I know they have, like, the really I big zippers. I must have on my story, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm so weird. <laughs> the zippers are <laughs> zippering. Oh, my gosh. Maybe they were zippering. Yeah. <laughs> I know. It's so funny. Okay, so tell us what you do. I know what you do, and it's absolutely incredible, but I'd love to hear it from your words. Yeah, I always, it's very difficult for me to answer this question because I do quite a lot of things. Mm -hmm. So I study fashion journalism at Trump St. Martin's, and I do work as a journalist. Like I write for a few publications, but then I also run a YouTube channel, a fashion YouTube channel where I talk about fashion history and like review contemporary fashion shows and then behind the scenes I also do like consulting so I've Mm -hmm. done it in the past for like Jordan brands um now I'm kind of working with Nike not on the consulting end but like in a different capacity um Mm -hmm. so I do quite a lot of things yeah so I guess I'm all over the place that's crazy you're covering a lot of bases it's like multidisciplinary but like within the sphere of fashion which is like so unique to have so many different roles that's amazing how did this all start for you like how did central saint martin start like what initially inspired you because i think i did hear that you had another career path in mind before you ended up switching to fashion yeah yeah it's quite funny because um obviously having nigerian parents there's only like five careers you can really realistically go into you either yeah. have to be like a lawyer a doctor an engineer an accountant or like some finance bro and like <laughs> everything else is just like they're not even real jobs yeah so because that was the mentality that I was brought up with and I was good at science subjects and I didn't know what I wanted to do my mom was like well you can do engineering <laughs> you're good at science so obviously that I ended up studying engineering still not knowing what I'm doing and um, the summer before I was supposed to um, study chemical engineering, actually, so mm-hmm. just before I was about to go to school, I was doing this job where I would like do like house removals. Mm-hmm. So I'll take people's furniture from their house in London and then move it where in Europe they want to move it. So oh. this specific day, I moved this woman's stuff called Benice Pan. So she was moving to Calais in France. So. I took her furniture from her house, like dismantled her beds and her fridge, wow. carried it into this truck, took the truck to Calais and then was like offloading it into her house. Yeah. And I saw her face on like a magazine or something. And I was like, do you work in fashion? Like, how come you're on like this magazine? She's like, yeah, I have a fashion brand. And I was like, that's wow. so cool. And then from there, we literally just had a long conversation about fashion. Because uh-huh. then I hadn't worked in fashion ever. But I like was so interested. I used to read about it all the time. I was a basketball player, and there's kind of those associations like being into fashion and knowing about like streetwear and stuff. So we were just talking for like hours, and then she was like, "You're really interesting. We should have dinner." So we had wow. dinner that day in France, and then I don't know if she liked the conversation, but she was like, 
I've been looking for an intern and you seem to be like the perfect person. Yeah. So she was like, when can you start? And I was like, now. <laughs> and I like left, I literally quit my job. And then um, I started working for her. And that is literally how I got my start in fashion. I was like, all by mistake, which is so funny. That is crazy. Um, Cause I yeah. knew you got the internship. I didn't know it was a story like that. That was like yeah. fate just like hitting right moment, right time. Like starting yeah, with too. furniture and all of a sudden you at dinner with this lady. <laughs> <laughs> that's absolutely fantastic that like you need to write a book about that like literally <laughs> called the fashion roadmap that would be so smart i'm so smart that's such a good idea yeah no that's absolutely crazy what was your parents reaction when you just dropped everything were they like okay what are you doing now like yeah what was it well no they didn't care because it was just a summer job mm. so as far as they're concerned i was just doing a different summer job Got it. But they, my parents always wanted me to work in the summer because my parents' philosophy is that, like, if you're an idle black man, you're going to end up doing the wrong thing. Oh, no. They just never want me to be idle. They're like, no, we don't want you on the streets doing bad things. So they always, even when I was younger, in the summer, I'd be doing, like, maths lessons and stuff because they just didn't want me to be idle. Wow. It's so funny. But, um, <laughs> so, yeah, I... so. Then I did the engineering degree, and every summer mm-hmm. I was working with this brand, Defoy London. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think by the end of my time studying engineering, I was just like, yeah, I'm not going to be an engineer. Like, yeah. I don't like it. I prefer fashion. Um, and that's when I started, in a way, plotting. Like, it was by the final year of studying chemical engineering that I was thinking, okay, how am I going to break into this industry? I know I want to be a fashion journalist. Like, how how am I going to do this? Especially around that time, there was like a big picture that came out of um, the British Vogue star when Alexander Shulman was editor in chief Mm -hmm. and everyone was white. Like there wasn't even one Asian or black person, like every single person was white. So seeing those kind of things, it just made me think, yeah, I don't know how I'm going to break into this industry. Yeah. Um, But who knows? And I came up with the idea to start a YouTube channel because I was always on YouTube. I used to watch so many people. Mm-hmm. Um, I used to watch people like Unknown Vlog, Sanjeev, Magnus Running, Fernando Rangel. But all these guys, they used to like make styling videos. Mm-hmm. And I was like, so people watch fashion videos on YouTube, but why is no one talking about like the runway show? Right. All the stuff that I was learning on my internship, like pattern making and like all the different jobs that you can do within fashion or like, I went to a Balenciaga show when I was working at Deploy. Like, why is no one, like, breaking down those kind of shows? Right. Um, so that's how I came up with the YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. Like, I was like, oh, this would be good. Like, if it, like, works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And that was kind of my gateway to breaking into the industry. Because when you build a YouTube channel and people start to know who you are, then they start to ask questions like, where did this person come from? What do they do? Where do they study? And then when people find out, oh, he actually studies journalism. Oh, he's actually a journalist. And then I started getting, like, work from it and started working with magazines and, like, brands and stuff. Um, And that was, like, my way of breaking into the industry. That's absolutely incredible. Without YouTube, literally, I don't know what would happen. Yeah, I mean, that was such a smart move because, you know, there are a lot of people, I believe, that, you know, wonder about fashion. And I feel like YouTube and watching YouTube videos is a casual way for people to, you know, gain more knowledge within the industry. So it was so smart to, like, not only be able to exercise that fashion journalism, but build yourself as a personality. Because, like, I'm sure viewers, like, I definitely connect to you. Like, I just feel like seeing someone that looks like you having like the knowledge, like the deep knowledge of the fashion industry is actually more important than it may seem because I know that I can go to your content with like, you know, a very optimistic view of you're just going to like tell it like it is. You're very logical and everything like that. So yeah, that was perfect. And actually that just reminded me how I found you. I was on LinkedIn and, you know, I follow like a few fashion things and I was scrolling and I saw the article from Vogue that was, you know, talking about different journalists that were on the rise and that's how I found you initially and then like when I went to follow you I saw that Bliss Foster actually who was a huge ride or die for you actually (laughs) was like following you and saying so many things yeah are you kidding (laughs) like he like reposts your like stories and stuff like that and he's like go follow Ojo yeah he's like a huge fan you've never talked to him yet 
<laughs> oh no, no, I've met him in person a few times. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, he he loves you apparently. Um, <laughs> yeah, but that's such an amazing like organic uphill climb. Like that's absolutely incredible. I want to know about some of the things you're doing now. Like I I feel like it must be amazing to be recognized as a fashion journalist so early on. And you didn't even graduate yet, did you? No, I'm in my final year. Yeah, because I know you're doing that project in Turkey. Tell us about that. Yeah, yeah. So I've actually, well, not finished, but I finished filming it. Mm -hmm. um, so I went to Turkey to film a fashion documentary. Mm -hmm. um, nothing, nothing too complicated. It's really just like highlighting the fashion scene in Turkey. So I interviewed a few designers, went around their studios and filmed it them talking about their work essentially mm -hmm. um, and the whole reason why I wanted to do it is like as a fashion journalist fashion is the only industry where people seem to focus on specific regions mm -hmm. like if you're a news correspondent you just go to where the news is right like it doesn't matter what country but in fashion it just seems like most journalists only focus on like Paris and Milan and New York and London yeah which I've never really agreed with because there's fashion everywhere in the world so if you're a fashion journalist, I feel like you should just go where the stories are. So I came up with this idea to go to Turkey because it's a region I haven't seen many people cover in terms of the designers. People talk about the factories. Yeah, that's the first thing I was thinking of. Yeah. Like, I'm a stylist at a store and I look at that tag, it says made in Turkey. Like, yeah. that's all I know. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's what people talk about. But in terms of like the culture there, the scene, the brands, the stores, People don't talk about that. So that's the main reason I wanted to go there. And it was really interesting. I learned a lot from interviewing people. And obviously when the documentary comes out, I feel like a lot of people resonate with it. Um, but yeah, that was that was the whole idea of that project. Yeah. No, that's epic that you really thought against the grain because that is so true. That's the first time I'm really realizing that it's all Paris, it's all London, it's all in New York. But yeah, there is so many pockets like i wonder what's happening in brazil right now like there's just like know, yeah exactly. like literally like there's so many places like what's happening in afghanistan like yeah yeah <laughs> absolutely that's fantastic did you bring a whole team out there or was it you individually like who do you collaborate with usually oh no so it was just me so before this documentary i did one in south africa which i had a whole production team i saw a post yeah. about that one too yeah yeah but I kind of wanted it to be different. So at first I was like, oh, let me put a team together. But then I was like, actually, no. Because my whole point of like doing these projects at school is to test myself. Mm -hmm. So I felt like it being just me alone is another test to see can you actually make a whole documentary by yourself? Mm. Like with no team or like no help. It's just like a personal challenge. Yeah. And the next one I'll do, I'll do it with a production team. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I, we're going to see how it's going to come out. Yeah, did you have to like prop a camera on a table to like talk oh, to Oh yeah, people? I was carrying like my back hurt by the end of um, oh. the trip to Turkey because I had my tripod, my cameras, spare batteries, yeah. um, like camera hoods, camera rigs, all on my back walking all around Turkey. <laughs> wow, that's really intense. I don't know why I didn't think of a tripod. I was thinking of like placing an iPad on a table. That's my life, yeah. not yours. <laughs> it's not your life right now. That is amazing though that you committed to doing that by yourself. I mean, the reactions had to be pretty interesting. Like this student is dedicated, like what's happening right now? Yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And I think the good thing is that because at the end of the day, like, some of these designers are really busy. Mm -hmm. But luckily, I think now, like, a lot of the people knew me before I even went there, which was crazy to me. Oh, wow. And they all know me for different reasons, because mm -hmm. I always assume that people know me from YouTube. Right. Which obviously isn't true. Like, there are people I met, and they're like, oh, I'm, a, I'm like, I really support your work. I've read all your articles on BOF. And I was like, BOF? <laughs> no one tells me that. Yeah. <laughs> um. So there's like that. Some people knew me from YouTube. Some people knew me from like, like what you said, like LinkedIn and stuff. Mm -hmm. Or some people saw like the Vogue article for like all, all different reasons. It was a bit crazy. Um, so that definitely helped me in, even though it was just me, people mm -hmm. felt comfortable. They're not like, there isn't this just like weird kid 
It's like right. pointing a camera in our face. And yeah. Like asking us questions. No, totally. I mean, yeah, you're just like reaping the profit of being so multifaceted within the industry. I feel like that says so much that people can just like pinpoint you from so many different places. That's yeah. literally incredible. That's like something to be really proud of. Yeah, I guess I can't ask too much about the video release. I don't know when it's coming out, but will it be eventually available the for the public? It's just, it's just me, so there's no... Um, so what I'm going to do with it is I want to do a screening Ooh. for it in a cinema. Yeah. And then after the screening, I'll post it on YouTube. Okay. So probably like a week after the screening. And the screening will be at some point um, in May. Nice. That's yeah. epic. Okay. That's going to be a really amazing rollout. I'm <laughs> trying to think. Can you get awards for YouTube videos? I feel like, honestly, it's such... Like, YouTube is cinema. Like, if depending on who's yeah. involved and like there's some really huge documentaries on youtube that i feel like deserve the credit of like the oscars or something like that yeah oh yeah definitely it's just all those types of things it's just like who you know yeah to get into like the right space it's almost like art like you can have the same artwork in your house and no one cares mm -hmm. and then and the same piece of art gets picked up by Sotheby's and they can auction it for a hundred thousand. That's so true. The only difference in the artwork is just like who is looking at it and like where it is. Yeah. So it's kind of similar with like films and documentaries. It's like if it's on YouTube, just because it's on YouTube, people are like meh, but then you happen to know someone that runs a film festival and then it gets there and all of a sudden people want to, you know, buy the rights for Netflix or Amazon Prime. Right. And that's like the big difference. Yeah, it's just the difference of exposure. Yeah, absolutely. That actually gets me thinking about gatekeeping because I know definitely yeah. in the art world, which I'm in, in the fashion world, there's just like a huge amount of gatekeeping. And you saying that you were getting your start when British Vogue was like all white. I mean, that had to produce a feeling. But as you've grown in the industry, how has the gatekeeping been? Like, how have you been feeling finding your place within the industry? Yeah, I I will say though that I think fashion is definitely more diverse, like, especially because Edward Enningfall was hired yes. as the uh, um, editor in chief of British Vogue, um, and obviously now he has more roles, like he's in charge of like Europe and stuff. But he was very adamant on diversity. In fact, I was listening to one of his interviews, and he was talking about how um, when they interviewed him for the role, mm -hmm. they asked him like what he would change. And he thought he wouldn't get the job. So he just thought, I'm going to tell them as it is because I'm probably not going to get the job anyway. I don't even know why they're interviewing me. So he told them, like, it's not diverse. You guys don't understand what diversity is. And he just, like, blasted them. Oh <laughs> and they, my like, God. loved that he said that and they hired him. <laughs> <laughs> so he's been very, very deliberate about um, it being more diverse. And because of that, I've seen that diversity is definitely bigger the gatekeeping issue is definitely still a big thing mm -hmm. unfortunately um there's like this divide between the old guard of fashion and the new guard mm -hmm. where the old guard doesn't want to relinquish their power yeah um and the new guard is like fighting to get that power but then some of the new guard people that then have that power then become gatekeepers <laughs> and it's like you literally used to complain about this. yeah the same thing <laughs> It's a whole cycle. I think it's just like yeah. a human thing of selfishness. Like, I don't want you to have what I have, even though I just had yeah. to, you know, bust my butt just trying to get this right now. Yeah. It's, I'm... it's weird. Like, people people hate me because... Um, <laughs> what? Because some people... No, it's because some people say that I had to, like, scour the internet and buy $500 books just to get that information, and you just put it all in a YouTube video. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's real. You got to check out the free resources before you go buying books yeah. and stuff. Because there's a lot out here, to be honest. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's so wild. Because they want people to work as hard as they did to get the mm -hmm. same information. Yeah. Um, and that's that comes back to that gatekeeping mentality. Like, people want to hold on to certain tidbits of information because they want to feel like they're more intelligent than anyone else. Or they know more about fashion than everyone else. Yeah. 
I feel like I can see that in selecting creative directors too. Like the fact that Pharrell got, you know, elected. I can't believe I was saying elected like it's a presidency, but to me it's kind of like a presidency <laughs> or something. And yeah, I I feel like when moments like that happen, you do hear a lot of chatter about like, yeah, I just had to go to FIT and like graduate and do all this stuff. And I feel mm. like even as like an independent fashion designer myself that doesn't have any formal training, I feel like people just need to accept that there's other modes of education now and it's just not mm -hmm. this like streamlined process and be able to respect everyone from different angles because you know just because someone may have not graduated they may have like really real life experience that you know qualifies them to be a part of this role and stuff like that and I feel like there's still a lot of room to grow within that area because you could be, you know, Xing someone out that has so much to bring to a situation. And a lot of times it's like what degree is on there and stuff like that. But definitely agree that everything is changing now and things are really improving, especially when anybody has access to build a platform for themselves and like start a small brand or anything like that. I think fashion has been getting really democratized lately, which is really interesting and empowering to see definitely yeah i'm wondering what would you change about the fashion industry just like being within the climate being involved in everything what are some things you want to see evolve and change oh well um <laughs> damn that's a that's a big question yeah. uh, first of all coming from my like this is like my journalist mind talking um a lot of the magazines i used to love when i was younger I feel like they've all fallen off. So mm -hmm. like Days, ID, The Face. Mm -hmm. the, why I loved them was one, they were like quite anti-establishment. Um, they weren't looking for like the popular story. They were like really, really like, not underground because they're big magazines, but the stories they were covering were really like, here's like this person in Brighton that you've never heard of who's mm -hmm. like making cool clothes. And all of them have all gone to like, just covering celebrities. And then half of the magazines are just adverts. And it almost seems like there's no, like fashion now lacks inspiration. Mm. Like a lot of people just aren't trying to find a new story. It's just all about money, money, money. And the thing is like, you can do both. Like my magazine was all about up and coming creators because the reason I made it was to fill the gap and the void that was left by magazines by the face because it's not the same. Um, and it's still sold out anyway. So it's not like, you can actually make money without having to sell out and have like your your magazine full of Dior ads and now you can't say anything truthful about Dior because they're literally paying your bills. Right. Um, so it's all those like conflicts of interest, like all the magazines being sponsored by fashion brands to the point where like I'll read a Vogue review and I start laughing to myself because everyone knows the collection was terrible and then you read the collection and they're like, the set and the ambiance and the music <laughs> and the way the music filled the room. It's like, can you talk about the clothes, please? Right. It's like, we're trying to find anything to make this show sound good because it yeah. sucked. Oh my gosh. That's crazy. I feel like it takes a certain amount of just really being married to the craft to not let the money just like make you take flight and do all these different things and stay away from like the course of what fashion is all about. And I, I get it. I guess money and being in a big company, there is a lot of conflict, but I feel like it is making a lot of room for journalists like you to like fill in that gap that's being left by these magazines and still oh, being yeah, able to make that impact. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm thankful to them because they gave me a career right. without meaning to, because now if I release a magazine, like say I went to Turkey and did like the Turkey issue of the Fashion Archive magazine, no one does that so it's mm -hmm. inevitable that it'll do well but that's because magazines aren't doing what they should be doing mm. or what they're supposed to be doing yeah it's very selective journalism based on hype and everything like that yeah, yeah. Ah, is that what the world is coming to oh my gosh <laughs> that's so interesting but i really feel like yeah just like i said it's making an avenue for very niche conversations niche articles and stuff and i feel like because people have such a focus towards diversity, eventually people are gonna like kind of avert their eyes and look at what other people are independently doing because they want that sense of difference. So yeah, in a way it's making room for amazing people like you. So it's And I, I do know something um, interesting that you just pointed out. So 
I always talk about like the benefits of diversity because a lot of people just think it's just like they're just throwing Asians into the room or throwing black people mm. um, mm-hmm. and stuff like this. But actually, if you're in a creative space, diversity actually helps your business. It's not even about like just different faces because when you bring different people, different perspectives and different um, upbringings and different cultural references, that can always create something better creatively than people that all come from the same place. Yeah. So like, if you take, I don't know, let's say some 10 rich white women and put them in a room, they all have the same references. They all go to the same shops, they go to the same places, listen to similar music, like have a similar personality, drive the same type of cars. You're not really gonna learn too much. They're not gonna learn much from each other like there's there's not really too much creativity that's going to happen there but you take someone that was brought up in mexico and then you put them in a room with someone that was brought up in england and you put them in a room with someone that was brought up in spain and then someone that was brought up in ghana the amount of different cultural references and the different things that they can learn from each other even down to like creatively references you're going to always have something better creatively from that circumstance than the first thing the first circumstance I just like put forward was like 10 rich white women yeah. from a similar area. Um, and that's also a big reason why diversity is really important, especially in a creative field. Yeah, 100%. I don't understand how people couldn't get that. Like, that should be so obvious. It's like, don't you want your work to be good and powerful? I feel like that's the whole point. Literally. But yeah, I feel like, yeah, some people are waking up, other people, I don't know what's going to happen with them. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's absolutely incredible, though. What in fashion is, like, really exciting right now? Like, what is something you're really focusing on, like a big project or anything like that, besides Derby? Uh, me, personally, um, well, I mean, the Cortez collaboration with Nike just happened. Um, nice. I am making a video on that because I thought that was really, really good. Like, that was one of the best collaborations I've seen in recent yeah. time. Um but apart from that, like, there's something I'm working on with Nike. Can I talk about it? I guess I can. Um, Yay! We're getting this so, news first or something? Oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> yeah, exclusive. Um, so, I'm not sure if you realize, but, like, like, Jordan Brand is, like, big in Paris. Oh, I didn't um, know that. And Jordan Brand is, like, yeah, it's, like, huge. I mean, Paris Saint-Germain, which is, like, the biggest uh, football team in Paris, mm. um, they're sponsored by Jordan Brand, right? Oh. Um, so Jordan culture is like huge in France. Of course, basketball has always been a big sport that they're trying to grow. Um, and now that Jordan Brand is like trying to be the same in the UK. So they're trying to like infiltrate and like influence sports culture here so that more people play basketball and subsequently then Jordan Brand does better financially because if you have more people playing basketball, inevitably they're going to want to wear Jordan Brand. Mm-hmm. Um, and so because I'm at the intersection of being a fashion journalist who used to be a basketball player, who understands the fashion scene in London, but also understands the basketball scene and the basketball culture here. Um, so I was working with them in terms of like them trying to understand the market in London in terms of like where the basketballers play, what type of clothes are they wear, where do they hang out, da, 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 all that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, just so that they can like understand the best way to try to infiltrate the market. Yeah. Um, so that's just really interesting because I want to see how they do it. Like, yeah. I'm be watching closely. Yeah. So you're basically helping them navigate the scene yeah, in a way. Basically. That's fantastic. That's amazing how that comes full circle from you being a kid, just liking basketball, like just so yeah. Jordan <laughs> Brand. Are you kidding me? Your story is so wholesome. You need a book. <laughs> you need a book. <laughs> that is really amazing. Yeah. I don't think. I don't think too many fashion journalists could work with sportswear companies in the capacity I do because I used to play so many sports mm-hmm. um, and I still do, especially basketball. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I don't actually know any other fashion journalists that like used to be a basketball player. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's very like streamlined. Like fashion has been my whole life. Like I read yeah. Vogue when I go to sleep, like type of stuff like that. I'm reading Vogue since I was five. Right. My mom used to, she was a tailor, like this, this story. Yeah. 
Oh my gosh, that's so cool. That's so cool that they would reach out to you for that specific niche information. They're smart for doing that, honestly, because I haven't heard of another brand really doing that. But then again, I've never heard of a role like this. Yeah, but then that's why I think that Nike is always going to be the best brand because they care about stuff like that. Mm -hmm. That's why, like, culturally, like, if you look at um, what's going on right now in contemporary fashion, like, you think of Nike. They worked with Cortese, that was a big success. They worked with Adelablo, that was a big success. Mm -hmm. And then you flip it and you look at like brands like Adidas, mm -hmm. and then their situation with Ye, they've lost like billions of dollars yeah. because of the situation with Ye. They tried to sue Tom Brown, they lost, they lost hundreds of millions with uh, Beyonce's collaboration with Ivy Park because yeah. it's not selling. And you can clearly see a difference because Nike, before they do a collaboration, will actually interview people, will ask, does it make sense? We'll find out from people that actually live in the area. Is this cool to kids? They'll actually find out. They'll be like, what are like the things that could go wrong? They'll consider everything mm -hmm. before they do it in a way that Adidas don't, which is why they always end up in trouble. Yeah, and, wow. And now they're like billions in the hole. Gosh. They just don't do their due diligence properly. I've never heard that explained so well. They are in a lot of trouble. Yo. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I should say prayers out or not. <laughs> yeah. even, like, they've, they've just just bad moves after bad moves. Like even um their collaboration with Balenciaga was that advert that was like the controversial one. Yeah. So then they couldn't it wasn't selling as well as it could, so they lost money with the collaboration of Balenciaga as well. Mm -mm. So <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm saying, but that's what happens when you don't do business in a way where you're really trying to find out on the ground, like what people would actually resonate with, and also doing background checks on your collaborators. Yeah. And see, like, could they be a flight risk, like Kanye West? Yeah. I mean, yeah, hard to admit, but absolutely. Like, it does really take all of that. I feel like probably people on Adidas are. Like, this is a big name. We got to jump on this. Nobody else is doing this. Let's go. Let's exactly. go. Let's go. But that fast thinking and that impulsiveness is what's going to make you make all these errors. So good on right. Nike for actually having a strategy. I feel like that is probably because of a, a diverse team that is actually thinking these things through and everything like that. So, yeah, it's very cheap. In fact, I know a lot of the Nike team and it is very diverse. Actually. Oh, that's nice. At least that's the Nike team in London. I don't know about like the main team in Portland or wherever. Yeah. But the London team is very diverse, yeah. Yeah, because now that I think of Nike and all their subsidiaries, like, there's a Nike Chicago, like, that has their own platform and that, you know, calls upon Chicago artists and stuff and really tries to create a culture within Chicago. So, yeah, they're doing things right, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. That's so exciting that you're involved in that, though. That's crazy. What have been some of your biggest influences rising within the scene this is curators of culture so i like to see how people are influenced and how they're influencing others so has there been, there been anybody that you've looked up to oh yeah i look up to a lot of people especially so there's a lot of writers i like like mm -hmm. rachel taspian um writers like robin gavan writers like alexander fury kathy horan uh, Susie Menkes, even though I feel like she's lost touch a bit, but I Aww. feel like I've heard the old stuff that she used to write and stuff. Um, what Edward Denningful was doing. I love her. At Vogue. Um, yeah, just so I have so many influences. Those are, of course, like journalists. I like Ib Kamara, um, who right now he's the editor in chief of Days, but yeah. also I just like his stuff as a stylist. Absolutely. I think he's an exceptional stylist. And he's doing a lot of um, off white too, which is really yeah, amazing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. And um writers like Casian Myers, he works with Dazed a lot now and like one of my favorite magazines, Lunch magazine. He did a project with them. Um so yeah, I just get inspired by a lot of people and different types of creators and people in fashion. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah, keeping the diversity circle around, everything like that. Yeah, yeah, I think the generations coming after this, the things that people like you are doing right now, they're just going to really benefit from. I think it's definitely going to change into a climate where people feel confident to walk into. I feel like it's already happening, but generations down the line, I feel like all of this stuff is really going to be worth it, and we're going to see a really healthier, diverse yeah. fashion climate. That's my hope. I guess I'm optimistic, but yeah. 
no, I, th- <laughs> I think it should be good. Yeah. And honestly, like the scene with emerging designers and different things like that really gives creatives like me hope too, because you can see that people are coming from different facets and really being able to achieve things. So yeah, I feel like it's a hmm. very much improving climate, which I'm really excited to see what you continue to do and you know how the fashion climate changes and everything. How wait, how long have you been in London? Did you move as a kid or Oh, so um I was born in London. Oh, okay, okay. And I was I was in London till I was nine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, nine. And then I moved to Nigeria for seven years. Oh, okay. And then I came back to London. Yeah. Okay, nice. Huh. Yeah. You got a taste of both <laughs> worlds. That's really nice. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't been out of Illinois hardly. That's crazy yeah (laughs) you're definitely well traveled yeah I I mean what am I I'm 23 and I'm just gonna be going to like Europe for the first time next month that's gonna be yeah that's amazing yeah I love it I hope I love it too it's it's weird it's very different to America because um I have so many American friends I mean I've been to the U.S. like 10 times so Mm -hmm. I can like tell the differences like in America you have different states and they might be slightly different but not really whereas europe all the countries are like really tiny Mm -hmm. and once you cross the border it can be like a completely different language completely different culture completely different way of dressing even the architecture is different so europe is like very unique where in like a tiny space there's all these different cultures and languages and foods and all that sort of stuff so there's so much to explore i'm almost jealous jealous i I could like I wish I could experience everything again for the first time. Oh. The first time is always best. <laughs> I'm like, wait, you're jealous of me in the States? I'm like, oh, I think it's flipped around. <laughs> it's like when we cross borders, it's like a different twang of an accent and different political views. <laughs> You'd be seeing different flags, like, where am I? <laughs> yeah. No, but I'm definitely excited to immerse myself. And it's crazy because... I was just supposed to be going to, like, a random reggae concert, like, in May, like, from December. That's what I had scheduled it for. And now I have so many amazing people meet an actual business out there. So I'm, I'm very excited. Yeah. London is seems like such great. a great place. And very excited for that. Yeah. But thank you so much for talking. This has been so eye-opening and so amazing. Where can everybody follow you on socials? Oh, you can follow me at Fashion Roadman. Okay. on most of my social media pages so that would be tiktok instagram twitter and youtube um and apart from that you can follow me on linkedin via my name um and that way you can follow like the articles i write for different publications oh yeah i need to do that because i'm just following you on instagram and youtube okay i'm about <laughs> to go to linkedin where it all started and click on that follow <laughs> again <laughs> All right. Thanks, man. I really appreciate you talking. I'm excited to see the turkey video and everything else you do from here on out. You're incredible. No worries. Thanks a lot for having me. Yeah, absolutely. You've been listening right. to Curious you, Culture with me, Morgan Lee. Our theme music is by Shawnee Jones, recorded at Berwyn Recording Studio. If you've enjoyed the show, be sure to subscribe and rate it wherever you listen to podcasts. You can follow the podcast on Instagram at Curate Culture Podcast. Until next time, stay aware, stay curious, and stay creative. Bye.